Hey, fifth graders. Uh, welcome back, everybody. We're here for a virtual session. I'm Ranger Hazel. It's Ranger Pine. Ranger Paul. And we're going to take you on a hike today here in the beautiful mountain park. Mm. We're going to take a quick look at some wildflowers, some birds that are moving back into our area, and a look at energy and how we get our light, heat, and power. So uh, that's our goal for today's hike. We hope everybody's doing well, and we're glad to be here with you, even from far away. So I don't know if you can hear those birds, I hope you can. Um, at this time of year we have a lot of birds that are returning with migration and the forest is full, especially earlier in the morning, full of sounds of bird songs and bird calls. Um, those are two different ways that birds communicate. A bird song is long, so you can kind of use that bit of rhyme there to help you remember that but usually there's a lot more notes. So if you think about a robin singing or when you think about songbirds, they usually have a lot of different notes and they have a little phrase that they kind of sing and repeat. And a bird's song is longer with more notes and it's meant to be impressive. So they are um, usually claiming their territory. There was a hummingbird. Awesome. Can't catch that on video very well. Hopefully you heard it though. Um, but a bird will sing into its territory, and if another male bird hears that song, he knows that this area probably has a mating pair and a nest somewhere, that this is that bird's territory. So they sing to claim their territory, and they also sing to attract a mate. Uh, bird calls are a lot smaller, so calls are small, songs are long. And a bird call is often to alert other birds of danger. So it's short and sweet messages, usually kind of abrasive little sounds. Or if they found some seeds, they might be calling to other of their kind to come and like join in and feast on the seeds. So I hear a few little calls, just like little chirp, chirp, chirps. And that's different than a song. It's, it's really, so those are the two different ways that birds communicate through their voice. They either use a song to be impressive, to attract a mate, or to claim their territory, or they use the small calls just to let each other know that they found some food or that there might be danger, such as large mammals like us hiking through the woods. Hey guys and gals, we found something interesting we wanted to stop and take a look at. This wasn't on our scheduled program, but we thought it was neat enough we'd, uh, we'd let you guys have a look with us. So we found, unfortunately he's dead, but uh, this actually helps us out because we can take a look without him mm -hmm. getting away from us. Ordinarily this little snake would be slithering away as fast as it could because we're a lot bigger and our eyes are in front, so we're designed to hunt. He's ready to hide from us. This is a western blue racer and we found him. He's dead. We don't know what killed him. He's got a little injury right here. Maybe that has something to do with it. Doesn't look like he's been dead that long. We want to show you some kind of cool stuff, some, some adaptations, if you remember those, that some snakes and, and uh, other reptiles have in our area. Snakes have no legs, as you know. And if you look at this guy, you look at him, you say, well, he's got no legs. How can he walk? How can he move? Well, they have a special adaptation. I'm going to show you. They've got these special scales on the bottom. I don't know if you can see. Each one of these little white lines, each one of those is like a little plate. But it's like made out of their skin. It's the same kind of stuff that makes up your skin. But he's got muscles attached to the bottom of each plate and he can move each plate like this. And so as these plates, they kind of wiggle in sequence and this snake, when it moves, when it's alive, it can contract muscles in order and slither its way to a hiding place to get away from potential predators like us humans hiking through the woods here. So on his back, he's got smaller scales just regular scales like snakes and lizards, uh, alligators, other reptiles have. And what those do is those help protect them from the environment. So they can slither through rocks and dirt and rough stuff, or they can uh, have some defense against some predators who might be trying to eat them because these are kind of hard and protect them from drying out and from, uh, from scrapes and bumps and stuff like that. It's a little bit stronger than our skin. But uh, yeah, this is a little guy. Unfortunately, he died. We don't know what killed him, but uh, just thought it was worth showing you guys. And showing you some of the adaptations that snakes have to live in a dry place like our Ponderoso pine forest that we're currently in. A 
How's it going guys? We just actually made it to the uh, power trail right now and we're at the head of the trail and we're about to get our way working on up. So hopefully we'll find some cool birds and some other interesting things to show you guys. So we, we left the Ponderosa Pine ecosystem. And while I was walking through there, I actually found a couple of small, I don't know if you can see these, two little down feathers from a bird. And I'm gonna talk to you guys about feathers a little bit right now. Down feathers, oh wow, a red-tailed hawk. We maybe should try to take a look at that. What you're gonna see when you're out here, you just gotta get out. Hope you guys can see that red tailed hawk. Um, but before that, I was talking about these little down feathers. So, birds have a lot of different kinds of feathers and they use them for different things. The main purpose of feathers on a bird is to insulate it and to keep it warm. But some feathers, like the down feathers, are specifically designed for that insulation. And down feathers, one way to remember about these fuzzy down feathers is that they're down close to their skin. So they have a whole layer of these really fuzzy down feathers covering their body. And then on top of those feathers, they have other kinds of feathers. Feathers are interesting. All these different feathers are made out of keratin, which is the same stuff that our hair is made out of and our fingernails. and. Um, so it's a little harder like a fingernail here and then the bird's body uses it to make some softer barbed things that are connected to each other sometimes you've seen if you have a parakeet or something you'll see it preening itself and it's what it's doing is reconnecting all those little hooks those little barbules to make a a nice plane that can catch the wind you can see it catching the wind like a sail this is a tail feather from a turkey, a wild turkey, and I'm sure you can imagine them all sprayed out in a nice display and layered to make those patterns. Um, so that's going to be one of the ways that the male will attract mates is that big display of tail feathers. So the coloration and the markings will all be layered and make a pattern. Um, tail feathers on a lot of birds, like that red-tailed hawk we were looking at, helps it to fly, helps it to actually um, change its course. So it's more of a, a steering mechanism. Whereas a flight feather, I have a really cool turkey feather, so that we had the turkey tail feather, and then this is one of its flight feathers. And the flight feathers are designed to help the bird gain lift and to be able to fly. So you'll notice that on the tail feather of the turkey, that quill goes right up through pretty much the center. It's equal portions on either side. Flight feathers are a little different. They're going to have a very short side and then a long side. And that short side is the leading edge. So I can tell that this was from the right wing of a turkey. And that little short area, the air goes across that little short bit, a little mound. And then on the back side with this long stuff, it, there's kind of a, a force known as drag and it kind of causes lift from the other side. So this is the same kind of design that we use on airplane wings, things like that. 
So we have flight feathers that help them gain lift, the tail feathers that help them turn and navigate a little bit. We have the down feathers down close to their skin to keep them warm. And then covering a lot of their body are gonna be more curved shaped. Usually they're gonna have some curve to them. And these are called contour feathers. These are the feathers that give birds their shape. I'm sure you've seen uh, maybe a raw chicken that's about to be cooked and it really doesn't look very aerodynamic, but it's the feathers that make the bird so smooth and sleek. So these contour feathers play a big part in that, making the bird's body aerodynamic uh, and giving it less resistance against the wind. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how to identify different birds by the markings the different colorations of their feathers a little ways up the trail up here. Right, so there is a bit of a breeze out today. It's starting to warm up too. I'm not really hearing as many birds as we were hearing earlier. One thing about birding, going bird watching, is that you often hear more birds than you see. A lot of the birds that we're gonna be hearing and seeing are small, they're, they're in the trees, but they're singing or chirping. And you can kind of count a large number of birds, but you might only see two, even though you've heard like 13 different kinds of birds. Um, so we often hear more birds than we see, but if you do get a chance, if you have some binoculars, it's a really good for getting up close, because obviously if you try to walk up close to take out a bird and look at the details, um, oftentimes, of course, they fly away. Um, but binoculars are good because it allows you to see the birds at a distance, but up close so that you can look for the details that I'm about to teach you about different kinds of birds. Um, a lot of small binoculars are really not that heavy. They can fit in a small little pouch like this. You can put it in your pocket, put it in your backpack pocket, take it with you. It's not a big ordeal and it actually lets you see a lot of things very close up that you might not get a better chance to see in such detail. Uh, one of the things that so we talked about feathers and we talked about how they're used to attract each other um, and one of the six ways that I want to teach you today on how to identify a bird if you're out and you do see a bird these are going to be the six things you're going to want to maybe take note of because you can bring that information back and you could google it and you could look up things uh, or use something like um, a field guide this is a nice field guide. You can find a lot of these. Some of the pages are starting to come out on this one. It's a little old, but you know, found it for two bucks at a, at a used bookstore. Um, and it's got all the birds from North America in it. So you take those six things that I'm about to teach you and you should be able to figure out what kind of bird that is. One of the, the two easiest things to remember, I like to do these in pairs. Uh, so we have six things, so we'll start the first two. Um, one of them is going to be size. Obviously, you know the difference between a hummingbird and an eagle, right? So we use size a lot. If you want to describe a bird to me that you saw, one of the first things I'm going to ask you is, well, how big was it? Was it larger than a robin or smaller than a robin or maybe a pigeon? It's one of those common mid-sized birds that we all know. And then you could tell me, oh no, it was, it was really huge. And so then I'm, I know we're probably gonna be talking about a uh, turkey vulture or maybe a red-tailed hawk like we saw earlier today. Possibly an eagle, especially if we're down around the reservoir. There's a lot of eagles down in that area. Or maybe an osprey, like down at the nature center. And if it was smaller, we do have a lot of smaller birds. And from there, we're gonna go on for some other details. So size is the first one of the six, size. Um, the next, if, if you saw this bird fly by and it went by fast. You 
you could tell that they were two different birds, but how could you tell they were two different kinds of birds? Right, by the colors. So you saw a really bright bird, this western tanager, yellow and orange, and then the stellar jay, which is blue. So size and color. Color is going to be a real helpful indication, because if you describe a bird like this to me, I know exactly which bird you're talking about, because there's only one bird out here that looks like that. But a lot of these birds look more similar. They might not have such bright, distinctive colors, but they're going to have other kinds of markings on them. So of the two, the two things that we've learned so far of the six is size and color. Next, we're going to work with eye stripes and eye rings. So if you look at this, this is a mountain chickadee, and they have a little bandit mask, a little band of colored um, feathers that go across their eye, and this is called an eye stripe. Lots of different birds have eye stripes, but not all birds have eye stripes. Um, in fact, the other chickadee, the black-capped chickadee, does not have an eye stripe, but it does have that kind of a black cap, like he's wearing a hat. So we have a black-capped chickadee and the mountain chickadee that has kind of a bandit mask. So an eye stripe, some birds, like this Townsend Solitaire, this one actually does have kind of an eye stripe, but the most distinctive thing is that white ring around the eye, which is made up of a bunch of very small white feathers. Um, we have, of course, whites of our eyes and our pupil inside, but birds don't have eyes like that. So when you see a bird like this, it looks like it has whites of its eye, like the Western Bluebird also, the female, has a eye ring. The male does not have an eye ring. So that's going to be helpful identifying markers. Eye stripes or eye rings. So we've got size and color. And we have eye rings or eye stripes. Another marking on these birds is going to be what we call wing bars. Stripes. Marking us, markings on their wings that are very distinctive. Sometimes they're lines, sometimes it's a patch of color, sometimes it's a series of dots. Um, this northern flicker has an interesting spotted breast and then lots of striped lines on its wings. Very colorful bird. Has a red mark on the back and a kind of a gray hood. Pine Siskin has a few yellow stripes and then a few white stripes. So that's kind of distinctive. Evening Grosbeak has a distinctive wing too. So the wings are very distinct on these different kinds of birds. So that's going to be something you're going to want to look at. If you're looking at it with binoculars, look for eye rings, eye stripes. Look, think about the size and the color. And then look at the markings on the body. And a lot of times that's going to really help you clue you in. Um, another thing we have is tail shape. And many different birds have different shapes on their tails. Like this one's kind of just a rounded, kind of a, looks like a finger, you know a really square tail it's really has a nice edge to it so we have square tails we have rounded tails we have this one has a forked tail kind of like think of if you were gonna draw a fish maybe um, so that notched tail some of them are more notched, some of them are more forked. That's about it. I'd say square or rounded or notched. Those are going to be very um, helpful in identifying the bird. And then one of the last things that you want to look at, but is very important, is the shape of the beak. Because the shape of the beak, or the bill, is actually what ornithologists would call it. People who study birds, scientists that specialize in birds, are called ornithologists. And they would call it its bill. A lot of us call it a beak. Um, different kinds of birds have different kinds of beaks. And this type of a bird here, this is a bird that has a short, stout beak. So it's very strong. If you think of it as pliers, it's gonna be able to crack seeds open and get to the nut of the seeds. 
Um, other birds have long skinny beaks for um, getting in like under branches or under logs or in the cracks of the bark of trees where insects like to hide, either hiding from the sun or hiding from predators like birds. So this is more like a beak that's like tweezers. And this type of bird with a long skinny beak like that, it's not built for cracking seeds. It's too weak of a beak really for cracking seeds. This is a bird that specializes in eating insects. So this is one of the adaptations, just like when we studied the teeth, when we studied dentition on the mammal skulls that we showed you, the different kinds of teeth, a flat, a, a herbivore has flat teeth, carnivore has sharp meat cutting teeth. Um, an omnivore has a little bit of both so that it can eat both kinds of food. It's the same with the bills of birds. Looking at the type of bill that they have allows you to know what type of food they prefer or what they mostly eat. This is an insect eating bird. This would be more of a seed eating bird. You guys know hummingbirds, right? What do hummingbirds eat or drink? the nectar of flowers, right? And they have a long skinny beak, like a straw, so that they can get down into the heart of the flower, and they can use that long tongue to get in there and drink that nectar out. There we go, a couple of hummingbird shots. So we have that long straw-like beak, and they can use that. They um, Sometimes they can use that for grabbing insects as well. Another kind of bill is going to be a meat-eating bird, and these are called raptors. And raptors have very large, sharp, hooked beaks, so they're going to be pointy and curved, kind of like a, the meat-eating tooth that we studied when we were studying mammals. And all of the raptors are meat-eating birds, like these hawks. They're going to have that really sharp, curved beak for cutting meat. A lot of these birds eat other birds. These birds will eat small mammals like mice, or they'll catch rabbits, fish, things like that. And they're gonna use that really sharp beak to cut the meat, slice it off the bones, and cut up little pieces to feed their, their babies or just to feed themselves. So raptors have hooked beaks, and that's gonna be a meat-eating bird, more of a predatory bird uh, for other birds or for other small mammals. So we've got the, the six things. We've got size and color. We have eye stripes or eye rings, which are the different colored feathers on their around their eyes. And the other place is going to be their wing bars, the colors on their arms, the colors on their wings. We have the shape of the tail and the shape of the beak. So that's gonna be our six things. Those are some very important things if you're out um, hiking and you're looking for birds and you wanna jot those six things down about a bird you saw, chances are you're gonna be able to use a field guide or the internet or talk to someone who knows about birds, an ornithologist or a ranger. And if you give them that information, they should be able to have a pretty good idea what bird you saw. about the form they adopt. If they adopt the right form to harmonize with their environment, they're able to fly effortlessly without flapping their wings. They can do that for miles, all day long without any effort. They just glide around. They have really keen sense of smell. They're smelling for a chemical called mirin, which is released from decaying meat. So they'll just kind of float through these hills until they smell that. And then they start to circle and try to figure out where's the dead deer or rabbit. And they'll circle around and they'll kind of hone it down until they actually find the carcass that they can feed on. So 
their amazing adaptation. So this is a good time to talk about migration because the turkey vulture is one of the Colorado birds that actually migrates. It leaves in the winter time, uh, towards kind of the fall, when they start to notice the daylight is getting shorter and that's one of the signals that a lot of birds use to know that as the days get shorter in the northern hemisphere it's time for them to move to the southern hemisphere. Uh, the turkey vultures don't go that far. They'll actually just go down to Texas around that Texas-Mexico border there. Um, and then they came back maybe three or four weeks ago is when they start to show up again. And you'll notice them gliding around through Pueblo or out here even in Beulah. Um, and they're back and they're gonna help us looking for anything that's died so that they can eat that. A lot of birds will leave in the winter time um, mostly because their food source is gone. So all birds have feathers which help keep them warm. So it isn't the fact that it's cold that makes some birds want to leave. Some birds stay here all winter. And those kind of birds that stay here all winter are still able to find seeds. So a lot of the seed eating birds stay here. Um, but if you're a meat eating bird, a lot of them will migrate where there's still animals that are more active. Uh, if you're a hummingbird, you need to be in a place with flowers, and we know that in the fall, we're not having very many flowers out here, especially in the winter, there's no flowers. So they like to leave so they can go to a warmer climate, like Costa Rica or something, where there's lots of blossoms, uh, and then they come back as things start to blossom here in the springtime. Uh, birds that eat insects, insect eaters, they're going to have to navigate and migrate as well, and they're going to have to go to a warmer area where insects can be out so they have a food source so the reason that birds migrate is so that they can continue to have a food source um, and they interestingly enough birds navigate using the sun they can get their directions from the sun they also actually use the stars and that's a very interesting thing that ornithologists have discovered is that some birds actually use the stars at night to navigate and find their way south um, some birds even have receptors in their beak that can detect the magnetic field of our planet, just like we would with a compass. And that helps them navigate and orient themselves to the planet. 